So then we scale, you take the best plane possible and we measure resistance to that plane. Um, and then what you, so again, this there is a sort of LP version here, which is what you have to do, but just think of beta infinity. Uh, beta infinity of xt would be, um, you take, a, so you take infimum over all planes of a normalized distance from, um, uh, how would I put it, uh, soup on the ball of xt of distance from the point of the plane normalized by t. So basically, yeah, so you, you are on the ball of radius t, you are center of the facts, and basically you take the distance to the best possible plane, and the plane changes, it depends on x and t. But the point is as follows. So these beta numbers have to give you a Carlison measure of the set as uniformly rectifiable, and that's a characterization. What's a Carlison measure? This is going to be super important because we will be talking about this all over again in many, many, many contexts. So nu is a Carlison measure. If it's, so first of all, it's an n plus one dimensional set. You start with something which is n plus one dimensional, which leaves on your n dimensional set times, or, or d plus one dimensional rather here. So e is d dimensional times r plus. So in principle, it's a d plus one dimensional object, which works as a d dimensional measure. So what actually happens is that uh, when you take integral on the scales from zero to r, integral on the ball of d nu, it's bounded uniformly by r power d, not zero plus one. And the way it typically works is that um, the objects which you are going to talk about being the Carlson measure, whether it's solutions to PDEs or these distances to the planes, are integrated against dx dt over t. Now, what's important here is the division by t. This is why it's d-dimensional, because dx gives you rd, and dt over t sort of kills the t direction. But the way you kill it, the fact that you are integrating against t means that something becomes better and better in t, but otherwise it wouldn't have got dt over t. So this Carlison measure saying, which is sort of a late motive of the entire story, and honestly, probably the reason why we know as much as we know right now, because you will hear Carlison measure about coefficients, about solutions, about sets, about everything. So the Carlison measure is going to be said a thousand times in this house, probably. Um, the reason it's the reason it looks the way it looks is that something becomes better and better as scales go down. So once again, we're talking of both centered on the set. And in this case, what I mean is that E becomes your set, becomes sort of closer and closer to planes as the scales go down. So with every scale, there is a plane approximating your set. The plane changes. But it becomes tiny bit better, the approximation becomes tiny bit better in the sense that integrated again bt over t, you still get better conductions. It's not super, you know, it's not really t power alpha, it doesn't have to be. But again, this is sort of the overwhelming sim of this, and that the solutions, the coefficient, the geometry, everything has to be tiny bit better if you're going down to scales, as you're, you know, going towards the boundary of the set. In the sense that integrated against dt over t, you have control. That's what comes and measures basically uniformly at all scales. So this is one of the characterization of uniform rectifiability through the Peter Jones beta numbers, but again, the concept will be coming back over and over again. Now, being uniformly rectifiable for many PD questions is not enough. We will discuss exactly which ones it is and which ones it's not. And what we need in addition is some sort of text. Because again, we're speaking of PDs. So in principle, if the set is immensely complex, you run your parallels, your solutions, your process, whatever way you think about this, you depure it, might get lost in those libraries. So you need a little bit of topology. And um, as usual by now, we are going to seek some quantitative notions. And the Correct quantitative notions of topology are so called forks or points of connection. So, the first one is um, what we refer to as quantifiable openness. So, in every, most of you have seen this before. So, for every point on the set, for every ball, 
there is a ball of comparable size inside the set. It doesn't take all of it, but it means that you know you don't have a completely um, completely empty intersection. One example of the to the contrary is a cusp. So here you have a boundary boundary point, you have a ball, and you have not enough inside to squeeze in a ball of comparable size. So this is one concrete example. You need this to not happen. So you need a little bit of access, you need a little bit of of balls going from inside. And another concept which is important is the so-called Carnot chains, which basically means that between every two points there is a pass, and the pass is kind of flat. Comparable to the distance, I mean, if you wish, comparable to the distance to the boundary, so the way you can see it here. So you have two points, just connectivity would be having some pass. Carnot chains connectivity would be having a pass, which you know consists of balls. Of comparable size. One example to the contrary is, for example, this one, in the sense that you know you can have two points inside the set. You can, in principle, make them arbitrarily close to the boundary. And while there is a pass connecting the two, it's sort of too long. You know, the pass has to be of the length comparable to, you know. Com comparable to the distance between the points. Here, the points can be arbitrarily close, and the pass would be super low. Um, so, this is one counterexample. Another counterexample, and to me personally, this is easier to think about, is just the ball with a fraction in the track. So, if you have something like this, a ball, and just a segment inside, it does not have any Harnack chains because because you can have two points here, which would be arbitrarily close, and you would take forever to walk around. So Harnack chains means that if your points are physically close, you, you can walk around between them inside the domain in a sort of reasonable way, and all this is quantified. Okay, so this is one example to that. Now, the domains which uh, possess interior and exterior port screw balls, Meaning you have one inside the domain, one on the complement. And the period of Harnack chains are all not contractually accessible. Uh, the domains which only possess inferior ones are called one sided non contractually accessible. The ones which are uh, or also uniform, but I'll, I'll keep saying non contractually accessible. Once again, remember this is about access, so that's why non tangential accessible. One sided entity means you have an access from inside, two sided, or just entity means you have access from both outside and inside. Quantitatively, as I just presented. Um, when it's non tangentially accessible and the port David regular, it's for that. I basically only work and only will be talking about when I get about the idea of the mind. So everything I'm speaking about at the same time, it's for that, but I'll be sort of interchanging words. And uh, of course, one sided core dark is one sided then say plus ADR. It is a twist. Since some sense get free, although it was very difficult to prove it was only observed recently, and some sense get harder depending on which dimension you are talking about. If the dimension is n minus one, if your set is n minus one dimensional and up to Magically, two meters. So no, no. <laughs> one sided for that and uniformly rectifiable is just for that. So, somehow, if your set is uniformly rectifiable and it has non tangential access from inside, it automatically has non tangential access from outside. If you want the regularity, it sort of keeps it, you know, the rectifiability gives you enough regularity to ensure that from one sided access and uniform rectifiability, you have. Some access from downstairs as well. This is by far not trivial. I mean, I will be sort of presenting you the theory. This was only observed recently. This is um, Azam Hoffman Marcel. Um, Nistram and Tora. I'd say 2018 ish. Very recent, but it's it makes your life beautifully easier. 
up until the moment when they observe that this, this were very different groups for one side of four dark domains and two sides of four dark ones. We will be talking about why it should. Um, for lower dimensional sense sets, this does not happen. I mean, even a straight line is not two sided in T. Think about it this way. So if you have you know, a segment which looks like this in R3, nothing is going to make it two sided in T. There is no way to make it two sided because you don't have the side inside. You know, two sided means that exterior has some patterns. And this is sort of the biggest challenge and the biggest magic of lower dimensional centers that you never have an exterior. And if you have ever worked with this, having an exterior is a very big issue. Yeah. Somehow having good geometry of the exterior is almost more important than having good geometry of the interior. It's sort of counterintuitive, but true for B So for D less than n minus one, you never have this. You, you don't have two sides of different tone. And you never have the other side, and this kills most of the hard dimensional methods. But the reason another piece of metric is that for lower dimensional sets, ADR itself assures you inferior force throws and material compaction. So in each case, there is something coming for free, but it's completely different. So once again, any of the lower dimensional sets will never give you two-sided domain ever. But the good news, any of the lower dimensional sets has interior access, just because you have a lot of access. Again, it's a proof. I mean, in this case, this is not such a difficult. But basically, from the you know, when you when you have such a small domain, there are always holes outside, and there are always connections just because you haven't walked in front. So this is sort of the you know two very different pieces of previous. And um, again, this keeps your methods different and interesting, but this is true. Okay. Um, a few credits before I go to the actual elliptic area for all the pictures that I have stolen. Um, some of them are stored nicely, not all. Uh, so the note that I have mentioned uh, for the notices of the AMS, um, I really recommend it, like one page very few, about the reliability. Uh, Falconer's fractal geometry book, probably fractal. Um, Morgan's geometric matter theory book also has some. So all of these have sort of nice introduction to what I have just mentioned. Uh, I stole something from the general lectures, probably just a picture of a um, Gibson domain, so don't take it too seriously. I could have drawn it. Uh, a ball I think I took from Wikipedia, so maybe it have a credit, but hopefully I'm not going to be sued for this. Um, Karnachians, etc., from Chema's presentations. He actually gave me formal permission. And that's that, I think. But honestly, I mean, all of this is sort of a very background material. Now, all of this serious stuff, elliptic theory. So let's talk about the yeast now. Uh, first of all, the guiding example. So I will give you the uh, actual conditions soon enough. But first of all, let's discuss of what we want to be able to. Well, of course, Laplacian and more generally elliptic operators. So the common same are divergence form elliptic operators. Everything I'm doing is always divergence form. I like having energy in life. This kind of energy, also the others. So it's always divergence form elliptic operator. So I have uh, mine are always positive, which is why I keep them with a minus. So sum and ij, uh, d, xi. A of x, a i j of x, d x j. So A is a matrix. It's uh, always uniformly elliptic, which means that uniformly in x, I have an upper bound and a lower bound on eigenvalues, if you want, whichever way you like to write ellipticity, but otherwise, this bounded measurable coefficients. Um, I haven't yet told you on which domains I want to discuss this, but of course, you know, to start with what we just um, defined ADR, you want to identify a full non conjunction excessive or dark, something like that. To start n minus one dimensional. 
Now, the second one, and more to the point of this lecture, is the case of the complement of the d dimensional set where d is, let's say, integer, or possibly not. But if you want to match an integer, but d is smaller than minus one. But, but it's possible, then it's necessary, or can you like, start with the top? Uh, say it again. Like, is it like passing electricity necessary, or like you also look at like? No, I look at a bunch of things. I mean, for now, those are just examples. So I'll give you proper definitions in, in five slides. I just want to, you know, run some examples to sort of spend the boundaries of what I'm discussing in some sense. No, it's not necessary. Yeah. Okay. So, again, set of views and integer are not but lower dimensional. Principle in that case, you cannot necessarily talk about this. if d is less equal than n minus two for sure. You cannot talk about the Laplacian harmonic functions would not see such sets. The proper, you know, mathematical way to see it is in the big sense. So, function is both harmonic if integrated again, say dc zero d to function and omega is zero for for the energy for grad u grad phi. Uh, if this is the case, you can also prove it strongly harmonic and you know, satisfies, you know, it's regular and satisfies the Laplacian equation. But the thing is, for lower dimensional sets, it automatically means that it's also harmonic in RN, means that uh, C0 infinity of omega is actually dense in C0 infinity of RN for lower dimensional sets, so you basically can ignore it. And then your function is automatically harmonic in RN, and you have to it to constant. Yeah. So you cannot possibly talk about the harmonic measure of functions in this way. If you like to think about them probabilistically, we'll be discussing this. Brownian travelers do not see low dimensional sets. So you're basically going to ignore a set with low dimension. So you have to do something about this. And um, the first thing people have been doing in this particular context is sort of considering nonlinear field of flush, and I'm not going to be talking about this. And they have some beautiful results, but as far as things that we are concerned about ultimate X or continuity of harmonic measure and things like this go, they couldn't prove it even on a lecture track. At least up until, and to be honest, I haven't checked in the past two, three years, but John Lewis, who knows everything about this, was telling me that he doesn't even believe it on a lecture track. It was I, oh, ish, yes, yes. So I, Possibly something has changed since, but I'm saying Pila Plush is not necessarily the best substitute, even if it makes sense, you know, formally possible. And the things that we have been considering and we have realized that are the generative operators in which uh, you take coefficients basically accelerating the Brownian travelers towards the boundary. So the coefficients of the generate, they carry the power of distance to the boundary, a negative power of distance to the boundary, which sort of compensates for the fact that uh, it is lower dimensional. The way you figure out, I mean, once you realize the difficulty you're seeking, the particular power is not part of figure out some sort of uh, homogeneity. You know, like the most idiotic way to think about this is you take a harmonic function in half space, you rotate it around, you get some solution in Rn minus R D, and you ask yourself what is there, what is it, what does it solve? And what it solve is exactly this equation. So sort of there is justice of the world. So this exactly what gives you the power. <laughs> but in principle, it doesn't have to even be that long. So more or less it tells you that this kind of operator should be feasible on the set with lower dimensional boundaries. More generally, you should be able to take uh, an, an analog of a vicious elliptic. So again, keep in mind, A is a matrix here. I might not be writing in the best possible way, but sort of a shorter walk and back version, but one of the distance is a scalar and it's a matrix. So it's just everything is multiplied by it. And A is an elliptic matrix. I repeat, D might be not an integer, in which case, you know, things become fuzzy. And then things get worse because you start asking yourself, you know, okay, I figured out this power n minus one minus d from the point of view of homogeneity. And again, to start rotating the Laplacian, rotating harmonic functions, but is it really tied up to the, to the dimension? In some way, it should be, meaning that 
as we discussed, you know, harmonic functions belong to lower dimensional sets. So, in principle, you need a power which has something to do with the dimension. But do you absolutely have to have this particular power? And when you start asking yourself more complicated questions, like what's the dimension of harmonic measure and things like this that we are going to be discussing, you realize that not quite. So in principle, yes, harmonic functions don't see lower dimensional sets if they are really lower dimensional. But they see a little bit of dimension one and minus one, I mean. You know, you could in principle go fractional in the fractional dimensions, you could go on fractals. What it tells you is that this power doesn't have to be completely tied up to the dimension of the set. There is some wiggling room. And for Laplacian, there is some wiggling room in the fractal set that you are considering, but also vice versa. Having fixed the set, even of a integer dimension, there is some wiggling room in the power that you are considering. So what is the room is a question. How much can you really wiggle? I mean, can you take distance to the power beta for which betas even for n minus one dimensional sets for which betas for you know fractional dimension what if your d is really smaller once again for which domains a r you are like in which context i'm talking about what if the dimension is mixed now can you make a list of operators which work for that strange chain of sigma both sigma both sigma both and the secret is you kind of have to you know, it's not only my crazy investigation which tells you that the set exists. Once you start working on the lower dimensional sets, you see that, you know, sort of modern methods of analysis make you consider the main dimensional ones. Basically, long story short, and again, this is just the beginning, we will see, you will see that it really happens, is that you have to consider so-called sort of domain. So when you have your complicated uniformly rectifiable set, what's going to happen sooner rather than later is that, remember, all you know is that the set is good to 1%. So 1% of the set is Lipschitz, you are going to try to take advantage of this in the Lipschitz energy. What do you do with the rest 99%? Well, you have to somehow shield yourself from it. And what you are going to do is to build so-called SOTOS domains, which basically, you know, take advantage of this 1%, and sort of shield you from the rest. Um, I'm not creating the best picture, but let's assume it continues somewhere here and you are basically doing this. So this would be a sort of domain. It coincides with your side to a big piece and you're shielding yourself from all the bad that is happening. If your set is n minus one dimensional, it's okay, and you're sort of looking from above, and well, it's not trivial to take advantage of this, but at least you know, looking from above, you have a little domain. If your set is d dimensional, then the only way you can shield your bad things is to consider two, two sided, you know, you have to shield by bubbles, right? You have to sort of put, I mean, you take advantage of this, you know, think of one dimensional and R3, but with the poles. You are going to take advantage of the pieces which are nice and vicious. But then how do you shield yourself from a hole? Well, you need a bottle, you need a ball, you need something like that. And this ball is two dimensional. So sort of naturally proven theorems, you are going to be down to so-called Soto's domains, which look like this. You know, it, it has Lipschitz bit, one dimensional bit, a ball, one dimensional bit, a ball, one dimensional bit, a ball, and something even more complicated than that. So that's a mixed dimension. You are not going to be able to report it and you need to be able to treat it from the point of view of elliptic theory. And again, you know, the extra twist is very in this beta. The betas are important, not only because we like them and not only we like because we like to confuse ourselves, but because they give some sort of a concept of differentiability and integrability on this horrible sets. You know, one good thing about Lipschitz domains is that you have also one potential derivative of that. So at least you have functions which are sort of, I mean, you are doing PD, you need to be able to differentiate and integrate at least one little bit, even on the boundary of the set. How do you differentiate and integrate on this, you know, simple that Right, you have to find the thing that I showed you on the previous slide. How in the world does the differentiation and integration on this? 
So this beta, if you are able to handle that, gives you a little bit of idea. So there is a so-called, at least, you know, in the case of dimension n minus one, you know, that's a very basic sense. So you take dimension n minus one, you take a plane, you take an operator which has a equal to identity. It turns out that this L, which in that case would be, so in this case, L is just minus d one over distance to the power beta, and this is distance to a plane, e is a plane. This operator really gives you fractional Laplacian on the boundary. So what I mean by this is that if you take half space, you take the cell, and you use it as a directly to Neumann operator. So you draw from directly data and solve, or the other way around. I mean, it depends on which which powers you want, and you get the Neumann trace. <laughs> This is the so called Caffarelli Sylvester extension. It gives you the fractional of Lashman on the boundary. A fractional of Lashman is the way to differentiate and integrate, depending on whether it's positive or negative. So, once again, the fractional of Lashman, and the way you should be thinking about this is, you know, in terms of the Fourier definition, it always exists on a plane. The fractional of Lashman is the differentiation and integration on the plane. Can be viewed as a different normal operator for this thing with a pattern. And there is a correspondence. So it's minus Laplacian to gamma if to gamma is one plus beta. It has been generalized to more general gammas, it has been generalized to more general manifolds, in particular, I'm going to give you a review by this chunk and some related papers going through a fraction of finite operator and things like this. So it, it connects to some very deep sense and differential geometry and one day when I have time in life, <laughs> I would like to be able to connect it more deeply actually. But long story short, there is, you know, there is a number of people in sort of geometric analysis who are studying the sense, of course, with very different questions. And it would be actually lovely to be able to connect its Hard. We have a very different language. They couldn't care less about the physical measure. And um, we don't typically consider the spectrum, which is more what they are sort of concerned with. But just to just to tell you that there is a goal down there, and I think that's important. And I think that we have more to do with each other than with the time. So, but you know, somebody courageous has to go and actually talk and spend time on this. But anyway, long story short, this beta is actually important. It's not a, a, you know, it's not an embellishment. You really have to be able to handle more general powers because it's, it's actually an immense luxury to have it. You can differentiate, you can integrate on sets where you wouldn't assume to be able to do it. And finally, you know, what if it's not just powers? Can you handle other degenerates? Um, or, for instance, if you are working with, you know, your standard, you know, Laplace on the Dewey graph or whatever you want with the half space, but now you are not considering questions with respect to the how to work measure, um, yeah, regular, you know, how to measure or uh, the back measure. So you are asking yourselves about the harmonic function with half space, or if you want a harmonic measure on half space. But now I'm not asking anymore if it's absolutely continuous with respect to the sigma with respect to the back measure. I'm asking what if you have a measure which is which has nothing to do with the sigma. They do have a right to exist. There is products in particular give such measures. For which operators, for which differential operators do they have a sort of continuity with respect to such measures? So, you know, all kinds of questions. I mean, nobody told you that you should be restricted to half dot measures. Nobody told you that you should be restricted to this operator and so on. And of course, bits and pieces, in particular, what I'm to present today, which is the basic elliptic theory, have been established before office. Actually, there is an enormous literature on generative elliptic equations. Um, I will not even try to give uh, you know, references here. I will try when um, the full version of lectures appears. Um, but um, to say a few words to those of you who sort of know some theory here, it's they essentially don't work on sets with lower dimensional boundaries, even though they pretend to. 
circumstance. It's either in the area rescue, right? You know, for the general, like for instance, for instance, if you send for PEP schemes or if you only add, um, similar papers for the general PDs, it's either in the area estimates or it's boundary estimates. But when you look at them closely, they require two sided T, they require two sided access, and you cannot have it on the dimensional sets. So it's kind of a pretense. You know, possibly lower dimensional sets, and I mean, they don't actually impose that the boundaries of dimension n minus one, but they do require exterior access, so you cannot possibly have it from the dimension. Yeah, that goes back to what we've been discussing with you, Michael. I was trying to recall what exactly they don't have, they require exterior access basically. So, there are things like this. Okay, now to our assumptions. So, with all of that in mind, we had to painfully figure out what's the most general setting that can work. And you wouldn't even believe that there is a most general setting that can work, but amazing it is. And it's very, very easy. Basically, the only thing that you need to run the so what I'm saying basically if you say a simple, you know, like the Bakrunian or Evans level of I mean depends on your favorite book of PDs, but you know, like your first book on the PDs that you have had, that's what I refer to as basically two series. So something like a chopper, a maximum fancy for normal continuity of solutions, things like this. It's quite amazing. The only thing you need is two doubling measures, one inside one of the boundary, related by this relationship. This is all you need, literally not enough. Can you repeat what I'm talking about? Dublin measure, which just means that if you take it on uh, twice the ball, it's uniformly. So if you have, for example, mu of 2b, twice the ball, it's uh, bounded by a constant times measure of the ball. And the constant is uniform. So it means that if you, if you took twice, it didn't draw a And same, you know, for any. So you have one Dublin measure on the boundary. And again, it doesn't have to be absolutely continuous with respect to the value measure, the power measure, whatever it is, since while. Uh, you have another Dublin measure inside. This time I'm assuming given by the way, to actually absolutely continuous with respect to GX, but just because I'm going to have two PTs. I'm taking an operator which is elliptic with respect to the somica. Um, Honestly, I'll typically be writing deep A grad and assuming that A is bounded by omega from above and below. But here, just for the sake of clarity, I'm writing elliptic matrix times the way. And they claim that all you need to develop the basic theory is um, this relationship. Um, if you had, you know, regular half space or regular minus one dimensional boundary, of course, this would be just dx, this would be d sigma of the boundary, and this would be one. Two minus epsilon is actually one because, you know, that's your set of dimension. But more generally, anything like this block. So if you think about it in particular, it would force you for DADR sets into having, if you, are, if you stick to power weights, so if you are asking yourself for which gamma am I allowed to take the way to reduce those to the boundary of power gamma, this is what gamma would have to be according to this. So your beta, your gamma, whatever you call it, you can go plus minus one from the basic dimension. So if you have an um, n minus one dimensional boundary in n dimensional world, you can go plus minus one but strictly between plus and minus one. Boundary allowed to be almost two dimensional. My boundary is allowed to be anything I like, but then my almost weight almost. has to be slightly. Yeah, it can be almost two dimensional. Oh. Enough to. Well, yes, yeah. Yeah. It can be, yeah, it can be really, really effective. What is the exponent on the R over S? Two minus S. Two minus S, so this is an S. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's uh, it's not super visible, but it's like this, this epsilon. And epsilon is, of course, anything and everything will be uniform on epsilon. So there is an epsilon bigger than zero such that.
So again, think of it as being, you know, you, you can get plus minus one from the optimal. So you're saying that, you know, the optimal sum is given by distance to the bottom minus D minus one, or more generally, you know, nothing in case of N minus one dimension with certain around. The truth is that you can get almost the plus minus one from that. And that's fine. So this is the, it, it sort of, you know, honestly, it's amazing to me that this is all that's needed, plus a little bit of topology with the sub map chain in the sense that we will discuss in the second, for n minus one dimensional sets. But basically, in terms of the relationship between the measure inside and the measure on the boundary, this is it. And then, okay, so a little bit of topology here. If D is bigger or equal than n minus one, then you need interior corkscrews and interior map chains. You need access. As we discussed, when n is smaller than d minus one, this is given to you for three. So I'm working on. Um, you don't have to, but I'm working on one side of the say domain just you know for the sake of these lectures. This is not a necessity, but I assure you, you know it's already general and faithful enough. So let's stick to one side of the MTA. Um, so in case of d bigger or equal than n minus one, you have to pose and promote the management. So you have it. You also need what we call the interior form current, which is basically this. You know, long story short, that you know, if you don't, I mean, this this is really you know the minimal that you need to do PDs because you need the connection between gradient and the solution itself. So you need sort of the functions to reasonably have gradient and make sense. But basically, I mean, to me, the easiest way to think about it this way. So all operators we are typically thinking about have this property that if you have a ball removed from the boundary, so that two balls are still inside the domain, then soup and inf of your weight are comparable on such a ball. For example, for you know elliptic operators proportional to distance to the boundary to any power, this would be true. Because your distance sort of raises from that. So honestly, in all examples that I can personally think about, even this is true, and this would give you inferior form correct. But basically, you know, you need to be able to define a open space, long story short. And to be able to define one big derivative, you need this, what I'm speaking. So that's that's all we are imposing. But to me, the and, and again, inferior formalities and inferior functions are more of an embellishment of what I don't want to make. You know, father is more general setting now. <laughs> to me, the only thing that you actually need is um, this. You know, this is a heavy condition. This is what's actually needed. And all of these assumptions will be referred to, don't ask me who is H1, who is H6, but you know, you will see me referring to H1, H6, H standing for hypothesis, and there are probably six of them in my actually carefully common, but that wasn't the paper. And I promise to never include you know, H3 or H4 separately. So it doesn't matter who is who. Just know that you see H1, H6, it means that. But really the only important one is basically this, this assumption. And then this generality, no matter what the measures are, no matter what they have to do with the back, you have actually a lot. You have the entire package of what I refer to as the basic electric set. Um, you have the sober space inside. Well, as I promised, you know, because I, I promised you that we will be able to define it or function with derivatives of it. So I'm referring to the W. This is A2 base, sober space, big derivatives on F2. You have the appropriate boundary version of H. So this is W is what you are used to seeing as W12. There is only one W in the stock. So this is a derivative of NL2 inside. There is the appropriate H, which is what you are used to as H1 half on the boundary, which is the usual trace of W12. Now, the way you define it, so in red is what's kind of new. So this row, you will see it a lot, is what offsets you, you know, from the, th that's exactly the thing which is controlled by R power, well, I saw by R here, so R power by minus epsilon. So this is exactly the thing that has to be controlled, you know, this is the only assumption, this is your scaling factor in some sense. 
So it's the measure inside divided by mu. And the reason I put R here is because this is what would be one if you are in half space or something like this. So the usual n minus one dimensional boundaries would have rho it would be one for usual unity operators. So this is my scaling factor, which is one in all you know, classical situations. Um, M is, of course, your weight inside. And so this gives you an appropriate definition of, if you think about this, this is the classical sober equation, which is the base of W1. But anyway, with this definition, you have usual trace extension theorem from all the years that, you know, Everson corresponding to what I just showed you. So trace of W1 half is H, sorry, W12 is H1 half, this is my estimate. For every function from H1 half on the boundary, you have extension to W12. You have boundary Poincare, which is the same as usual around on the boundary. So integral of U squared is bounded by integral of rad of U squared. You have from this existence of uniqueness of bridge solutions. I know I'm going super fast, but I'm kind of hoping that you have seen it and just trust me, trans, you know, the same. I mean, it's not easy, it's like 200 pages of proofs, but it's not utterly surprising either. I mean, it's, it's more or less, you know, once you figure out the appropriate setting, which was really the challenge, you know, to figure out the minimal possible conditions which would incorporate all of what you want. It's more or less, you know, you you go and sample by the cops. Existence and uniqueness of weak solutions by Lux Milgram theorem, uh, interior boundary, Kachopole inequality, and um, interior boundary Moser, interior boundary Harnack. So I'm doing something which is really, really faceless, which is inserted in the piece of, the, of my paper. Um, I know you almost don't see it, but I also, again, believe that you sort of should know what's in there. I mean, all I'm saying is that, you know, it gives what you think it should, maximum principle, regularity of solutions. I mean, you have, you know, supremum on the ball, even the ball intersecting the boundary, uh, bounded by the normal, like one normal solution, if you want. You have oscillations, you know, you have perfect continuity of solutions, the way you sent your show. You have uh, Karnat and quality, the way you sent your show. So, more or less, you know, the content of the feedback of the you have. If that tells you something, or ever. You know, so it's, it's sort of the. Uh, the basic setup you have. So, what time do I have? Like, I don't know. We're supposed to have questions as well. Um, okay, I'll time. take five more minutes and then we'll, we'll get there. I promise. We have a long lunch break, right? So, one thing that I want to tell you is that um, I'm almost done with this bit, I promise. Um, is that it sort of was surprising at some point. You know, think about it this way. As much as I'm presenting it as natural, it is and it is not, because the sense like here the continuity of solutions of the boundary and the classical set and the quadrant of the criteria, even just continuity of solutions of the boundary. Even criterion says that you have a complement of the domain. You know, again, if you have a cost, you cannot do this, thing, speaking. Well, depends on the cost, but actually you cannot. So in the case of n minus one dimensional boundaries in the Having a complement is a prerequisite for being able to define solutions, certainly for that being continuous. You know, this goes back to the back of 1913, the first counter examples to be a criteria, right? And what he has shown is that the cost we cannot have, we couldn't have a continuous solution even in the neighborhood of cost. So you need a complement of the domain to have this kind of properties, to have your continuity in normal situations, you need some stuff. Here you've got no complement. You have nothing whatsoever. I mean, it's really, you know, a segment and a string. And yet you have all of them. Why? Because you have sort of created a black hole. You have adjusted your power, you know, you 
because of this distance to the boundary factor and because I should adjust it exactly right. And again, I claim that all we need is this relationship between M and milk. You have sort of created a black hole. And I'm not, you know, this, this is not just an embellishment of the definition or something like this. This is because, you know, the, the original idea sort of comes from that. You know, I spent some time on Stanford painfully talking to geometric analysis people back in the day. And all they do is basically doing this degenerate in order to create the black hole. And this is a very different quantifiable way of it, but it's sort of the same thought that, you know, life is strangely good in black holes because you have accommodated, you know, this, because the fact that you have no complement is not really true. You have a massive, you have something massive inside the cell. So the point of, you know, treating the low dimensional sets is somehow making them look massive from the point of view of the PD and this is what they're doing. The challenge is doing it quite far because once again, you know, this black hole business is sort of part of some of my global analysis, one or the other way, at least it's coming from there. And it's all about isolated simulators. What we are trying to achieve here is something uniform at all scales. So you need to find a way to correct the quantifies. But morally speaking, it's really creating a massive complement in this context. And then with that, you have, you know, you can define the green function the way you simply should define the green function. Um, L of your green function is delta on the right hand side, zero on the boundary in the sums of traces. It possesses, you know, the same, I mean, it doesn't look super pretty, but, you know, you have to rescale obviously by M and O and whatnot, but it has the usual estimates you think the green function should have. Um, from above and below, I mean, it, it's sort of a order continuous of the boundary, it's proportional to delta of X power alpha, you know, you have some estimates from above and below of the boundary. So once again, you need character scaling, but in principle, you know, with, with that sense, look honestly from the point of view of basic elliptic theory, um, you have the comparison principle for solutions. Um, I'm shooting through, you know, very fast, but again, they sort of scale correctly at different levels. If you have two solutions that are comparable to each other. And finally, you can define the harmonic measure, and this is what I'll start my next lecture from. You have positivity, you have maximum principle, you have comparison, you have better continuity, no continuity of your solutions. So there is a measure given a solution, and this is what we will be referring to as harmonic measure. So in principle, you know, sort of same thing due to an abstract functional analysis. For every day that you have boundary, there is a measure defining the solutions for you. It's positive, it integrates to one, so it's a probability measure. And we'll start from there, there, next slide. Thank you so much. Solutions. Uh, well, the same same way as they would be for uh, since this is a general elliptic operator, okay, yes, C alpha. Nice. So C, C alpha as they would be. Uh, I say it's constant for this Uh Not really for the Euclidean distance because Euclidean distance is so if you if you did it if you if you manage that and that and because of this factor you know you always have less motor. So only if you have a smooth set, because then the distance is smooth. The distance very smooth. So you know, even though yeah, it's somehow secretly even if a is constant, then one over distance is actually not a super smooth way. So you don't get better than you say for uh, just round measure of coefficients. Let's go for lunch. <laughs>